Good evening, everybody. I'm Peggy Edersheim Cow, President of the Greenwich Library Board of Trustees, and I'm delighted to welcome you to Greenwich Library's signature series. The series offers dynamic public programming that engages the Greenwich community and region, featuring nationally recognized experts for conversations that promote an exchange of ideas. Our program is presented by the Greenwich Library Board of Trustees and made possible by charitable donations from our community. Before we begin, please silence your and put away your cell phones. We ask that you refrain from using them or taking photos during the event. Now to introduce our speakers. Our moderator this evening is Gideon Rose, the Mary and David Boys, or Bows, I'm not sure, a distinguished fellow in US foreign policy at the Council on Foreign Relations, former editor of Foreign Affairs, who has also taught American foreign policy at Princeton and Columbia and is the author of How Wars End. Our speaker, Fareed Zakaria, hosts Fareed Zakaria GPS, a weekly international and domestic affairs program on CNN, is a columnist for the Washington Post and a contributing editor for The Atlantic. Fareed is also the author of three best-selling books, In Defense of Liberal Education, The Post-American World, and The Future of Freedom. Esquire has called him the most influential foreign policy advisor of his generation. Please join me in welcoming Fareed Zakaria and Gideon Rose. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peggy. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and an honor. Um, I was here last year with Jim Stavridis, and that was a great session, and we'll try to do another great session uh, this evening. Uh, our guest is all the things you've heard, and for the last 15 years, incredibly, he has uh, been the host of uh, the most significant and most watched uh, current affairs show on, on television in America and internationally, uh, and has been uh, commenting, he's been writing a column for 24 years, every week, uh, putting himself out there with his thoughts, and has been writing books on the side. So uh, there's an amazing uh, productivity here, as well as an intellectual uh, consistency and quality that is nothing short of extraordinary. With that, I think it would be fun, before we get to some of the current stuff, to go back and take him through his uh, intellectual history a little bit. Uh, as on the along the route to how we got here. Uh, so Fareed grew up in India and came to the United States for college uh, and in the 80s. So let's start with the 80s. What was the intellectual baggage or framework or way of looking at the world that you brought from India to the States and your encounter with the States, how did that change it? So I came to uh, to America in 1982, um, and I'd say that probably within a few months, I became uh, something of a fan of Ronald Reagan. Now, you might find that odd, but I'll tell you why. First of all, I grew up in an actual socialist economy uh, where the government owned large amounts of the economy, massive amounts of regulation. Uh, marginal taxes in, in India when I left were uh, 92 to 94 percent on the on the last dollar, which uh, you can imagine e even even for those in Greenwich, what might seem a little high. Um, and there was also this fascination with the Soviet Union and, and the alliance with it. And so to come to the United States and hear somebody uh, like Reagan talk quite frankly, and I thought accurately about the fact that the Soviet Union was an evil empire, that communism was a terrible system, that it, it deprived people of liberty. It was a kind of refreshing, uh, you know, it was like a breath of fresh air after all the sort of non-aligned uh, nonsense I had, been, I had grown up with. And to see an economy that worked uh, w was, was an extraordinary feeling. So, I mean, I remember more than anything else coming to America and just falling in love with it, finding it so such an amazing, uh, extraordinary period. Part of that was I was a bit of an oddball in high school. I, you know, most of the people in India in high school wanted to be doctors or engineers. And, you know, here I was sort of, I was reading Henry Kissinger when I was 14. Um, I, I remember it vividly because my mom was a journalist and she brought the, the, the galleys of his White House memoirs. And I was sitting there reading them. And 
just to be at a place like Yale, uh, where everyone, you know, lots of people were as interested in these kinds of larger issues as I was, the professors were dazzling, uh, you know, it, it all felt just magical. Um, but I, but I did, you know, I was, I was more, I would say, uh, I was I was anti-communist, and that in those days people forget that was your kind of primary political orientation. You know that defined everything else. I was always socially liberal, but it didn't matter. That wasn't what you thought about when you thought about politics, because politics was fundamentally this great clash, ideological, economic, political, geopolitical between the Soviet Union and the United States. Everything else was sort of subordinate to that. And that was that was the world I came into at Yale. Okay. So you uh you come here for college, you stay for graduate school, you get a PhD in government at Harvard because it has the longest open visa that you could allow <laughs> you to stay. That's correct. Um you go uh instead of going into academia, you end up going to foreign affairs and you become the managing editor of foreign affairs. So let's go from the 80s to the 90s. Uh, you're starting your uh, journalistic career. You're writing articles. You're in a, what you, America in the post Cold War world? Did you predict the fall of the Soviet Union? How did the change in geopolitical context of the end of the Cold War and the birth of the post Cold War era uh, change your thinking uh, from your 20s to your 30s? So probably the most important thing, you know, of course, I didn't, uh, there's a personal angle to all this that that maybe Peggy should have explained. <laughs> so um, when I was a sophomore, uh, when I was the end of my freshman year, I think I started to work on a magazine at Yale called the Yale Political Monthly, that was being edited by Gideon Rose. Um, and at the time, I got to know Peggy. And I remember this vividly as a scholarship kid from India, going to New York City and, and visiting Peggy's Upper East Side apartment and being completely dazzled because there was like a mother well on the wall here. And there was a, I don't remember it all, but it was, it was uh, quite dazzling. But the reason I bring this up is because I did write an article in the Yale Political Monthly as a sophomore predicting a crisis of Soviet agriculture. Um, which tells you what a nerd I was, but it is my only claim to have in some way predicted the fall of the Soviet Union. In other words, I, I was one of those people who thought the Soviet Union was doing very badly. Uh, comp uh, you know, there were a lot of people like John Kenneth Galbraith, the em eminent economist who thought it was doing very well. Um, so no, I did not predict it. I, what I will say about the 90s is, to me, centrally, what, what happens in the 90s is that the... The, the the far left gets discredited everywhere. People now forget this, but there were pro-Soviet or Soviet-inclined left-wing parties all over the world, um, from Europe to India to, you know, and all those parties get discredited with the fall of the Soviet Union, with the fall of, you know, the exposure of the realities of what's going on in, in, the, in the Soviet Union. The moderate left, particularly in Britain and the United States, moves to the center, right? This was a kind of historical moment that, that Bill Clinton brings the Democratic Party to the center. Tony Blair brings the Labour Party to the center. Remember, the Labour Party had lost three successive elections. Uh, and then finally, he's able to move it. And I looked at that process and listened to people like Clinton and Blair, and I thought to myself, this is fantastic. These guys are now sensible on the economy. They are sensible on foreign policy. And they don't have all that crazy social conservatism. These are my people. And I found myself, you know, I would have described myself as sort of center right, moving more to the center or to the center left, because I found in the, 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 the you know, the kind of new left that Blair and Clinton were trying to envision something very attractive, which was a forward looking, you know, market friendly uh, 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 approach, but yet one that recognized that, you know, there were a lot of people who were left behind in, in an economy. There were a lot of people left behind in society and you needed to try to help them. Uh, but that, you know, you wanted the, the goose that laid the golden egg, which was the market economy to thrive and, and so that we could have all the revenues to be able to help uh, people. So I, I like that combination. And I have to confess, I'm an unrepentant neoliberal. I still think 
that the best combination is to have a very uh, to have an open market economy, an open society, one that generates dynamism, innovation, wealth, prosperity, and one is very generous toward people who have not been that fortunate. Because let's face it, most of the people in this room fall into this category. Um, we've all been very lucky, you know. I'm sure we've all worked very hard and all that, but there are a lot of people who work hard. Um, we have been very lucky, and part of the flip side of that that sense of being lucky is to recognize. There have been people who have been unlucky in life, and that you know it's it it is only just uh, to be able to try and do something to ameliorate those differences. The world in the '90s, and particularly by the late '90s, uh, seemed to be going in this direction. Not just had uh, did you have a third way kind of uh, movement, but even former socialist states like India were now gravitating towards uh, liberalization. You had a whole variety of different trends and. Then in 2001, 9-11 lurches the world into a seemingly very different era, uh, dominated by the class of civilizations, dominated by the war on terror, dominated by identity, politics, violence, terrorism. Uh, did you see that one coming? And how did your views change on uh, it from the 90s to the aughts? So that one, I have a bit of a history with, as, as you know, which is that when I left Harvard as a uh, finishing my PhD, I went to foreign affairs and I went to see my advisor, Samuel Huntington. And I told him I got this offer to uh, be the managing editor of foreign affairs. What did he think? And he said, it's a terrible idea. You should absolutely not do it. And I discovered then that, you know, for academics, the most important thing in life is to rep rep reproduce yourself you know, to produce other great academics. And so the idea that here was this, you know, star student of his going to go and do something else is a terrible idea. So he says, no, 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 you absolutely shouldn't do it. Um, and I sort of explained to him that I am going to do it. And, um, and then I said to him, you know, the one question I have for you is you sent me a draft of an essay for my comments called The Clash of Civilizations. Can I take it and publish it at Foreign Affairs? And he said, sure. And that essay, basically, um, in 1992, I guess it was 1992, um, predicted um, not 9-11, but it, it made this very central and I think powerful observation that the world of the Cold War had been one in which people defined their identities by you know, political ideology. Were you left wing? Were you right wing? What was your sense of whether communism was good, capitalism was good? That, that was how people defined their politics and their political identity. That when that go, you know, when that goes away with the end of the Cold War, people are going to be searching for a new way to define themselves. And that they were going to define themselves on the basis of culture. And that they were going to define themselves centrally on the basis of re religion. And I have to confess. I sort of bought that piece of it. He then turned it into a grander argument about how the, the world's civilizations were going to clash, hence the title of the, of the, of the essay. Um, but when 9-11 when happened, I think it, it affirmed the kind of fundamental insight that he had, you know, which is that human beings need some, something to define themselves by. They, they, they want to see themselves as part of a larger narrative. And if the larger narrative is not communism versus capitalism, you know, which remember causes people all over the world from Latin America to Southeast Asia to fight and die for it, there, there's something that people are going to be searching for. Um, and that this was going to be culture and this was going to be religion. And in many ways, you know, leaving 9-11 uh, uh, aside, even the, the immigration uh, uh, battles of today, the struggle that people, so much of it is tied up with this kind of new understanding of who we are, which is all wrapped up around identity, right? Whether, whether it's in France or the United States, or the sense that to be French means to be a certain thing, it means and it's somehow wrapped up with culture and race and religion, and you know that you're threatened by somebody who comes from another, that all those feelings seem to have bubbled up in, in, in the post-Cold War world. And that played itself out most violently in, with 9-11. Did your views about 
liberalism, the world, convergence, whatever, change during the aughts? Or did you, I mean, how did, how did the post 9-11, you were writing Future of Freedom, You're one of your best pieces, the piece where he became the first truly celebrity piece that you wrote or that gained you true celebrity was your Newsweek cover, uh, Why Do They Hate Us, I think, uh, which he dashed off in a week uh, after 9-11. And we uh, did did this, did your broader worldview change at all? Or Yeah, that was a, f- a fascinating thing just to remind us all. You know, there were these things called magazines. It was this sort of bu- bundled product and uh and I did after 9-11, I, I think I it in five days wrote this 7,000 word piece called Why They Hate Us, and it did fantastically. The only cover of Newsweek that ever sold more was the week Diana died, <laughs> um, to put it all in perspective. But but what's what was amazing about that period was it was a period where I felt intensely engaged because you know we were. I mean, I felt it very much as a New Yorker. We were under attack in a way that I think many of us thought the United States would never be under attack, this sense of vulnerability, the sense of, you know, why are they doing this? And yet, you know, I'm an Indian Muslim. And so I grew up in a world which I knew this world. I, I, and I knew it because my father was a politician. I had, you know, they, I had kind of an un- cultural understanding of it. And I always felt that, look, at the fun, at, at, at fundamentally what this represented in a very weird way was the complete triumph of the American worldview and the American model. Because here was this small band of deeply frustrated, totally reactionary, anti-modern uh, um, groups living in the caves in Afghanistan, protesting against it. And the only way they knew how to protest against it was to use you know terrorism, which is fundamentally the weapon of the weak, but it represented, in a sense, the the extraordinary hegemony of America and the American way and the American model that was now being challenged in in this violent way. By I I always thought it was one of the greatest tragedies, but I never thought it was as serious a fundamental threat to America as many people did. Uh, because I knew these people were ultimately acting in desperation. They were acting out of a, a, a sense of fear that the world was passing them by, uh, and that most Muslims didn't agree with them. That they, that the the truth of the of the you know the Muslim world was to look at where Muslims wanted to go, and they all want to go to Dubai. <laughs> you know, they all want to go to places that are modern and and allowing for prosperity and and allowing them to partake in the same, they, they, they were not uh, in violent opposition to th- this American hegemony. They wanted a piece of it. And if you look at what's happening, particularly in places in the Muslim world that are more open, like Indonesia, which is the largest Muslim country in the world, uh, or you know Indian Muslims, who are, the, I think, the third largest in India, they're all, what they want is more modernity, not less. They want to share in the benefits of modernity not be in violent reaction to it. You start, you write a book in this period called Post-American World, in which you're starting to see the end of the post-Cold War era, the rise of the rest. Uh, You become buddies with this hot new president, uh, Obama, who is photographed carrying your uh, uh, book around. Uh, You become the house intellectual of the Obama administration in some respects. uh, do you think things are now writing themselves? We're past the war on terror. We're past the problems, and history is going forward again in this period. What I think w- w- that book was all about was my realizing in the in the arts, as you as you describe it. That the, I mean, the big story of what happened at the end of the Cold War was really that we entered a world we had never seen before, which was a world in which there was no fundamental great power politics or great power conflict. Um, we've never really been in a world like that. Think about it. Who was going to challenge the United States? China? China in 1990 was 1% of global GDP. It was still, people forget, it was a poor peasant society. It had begun to reform and all that, but it was it was a tiny economy in comparison to the United States. Russia? The Soviet Union had collapsed, leaving behind a Russia whose economy contracted every year in the 1990s for seven years, 
to the point where this, the Russian economy had contracted more by 1996 than it had during World War II. So Russia was on its knees, right? And it was fighting an insurgency in Chechnya, and it was facing enormous turmoil internally. Who were the other ones? I mean, Germany and Japan, the other two richest countries in the world, were treaty allies of the United States that depended for their security on the United States, right? So think of how weird that world is. If you go back in history and you say to yourself, when would you have an era without great power politics and competition defining international relations? Well, before, you know, you have 45 years of the Cold War, then World War II, World War I, 400 years of internecine European great power conflict. I mean, you'd have to go to the Roman Empire or something to get to it, right? So it's a very unusual period where America really is setting the stage for almost everything that's happening. I know it doesn't feel like that being in America, but if you felt like that when you were outside. You felt, and that was one of the reasons for 9-11. That was the reason for this angry, as I say, kind of vengeful effort to tear down this enormous uh, hegemony. But the very fact that America had been this, this powerful and that it, it, the great power politics had subdued meant you created for the first time in history a truly global economy. You created truly open platforms, both trading and then technology. You had this information revolution that coursed around the world. And for the first time, everyone was playing the same game. Everyone could plug and play into this open world economy. And they did. And countries started to grow fast and faster than they've ever grown before. So in the period from 1990 to about uh, 2008, you lift 400 million people out of poverty mostly in China and India, but in other parts of, of, of the world as well. And what that is doing, and this is what I'm noticing when I'm traveling, is it's producing a real shift in the way these countries thought of themselves. They were First, you could look at the data. So the China that I said to you was 1% of global GDP in 1990 was by 2008, 14% of global GDP. Think of that, a 14 double in, in terms of its rise. Uh, India that was didn't register was now four or five percent of you know about a fifteen tuple rise. Um, Turkey, which uh, had been a basket case economy for most of its life, saw its economy quadruple, um, and all this economic growth was producing what it always does when you have, you know, when nations or human beings get rich, they 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 are convinced that they are also smart. That they are also powerful, right? I mean, we all know the billionaire who thinks that God has blessed his worldview and now he knows everything about everything. Um, well, that happens to countries as well. So, and I saw it in a country like Turkey, which I've been tracking very carefully. You know, once Erdogan comes to becomes into power, and after a few years, at this point, Turkey's economy, Turkey's average income has gone up fivefold. The country that used to uh, bow its it, 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 it head to the United States and ask, what should we do on every foreign policy move? Began to say, no, we're going to decide what we're going to do. We're going to, you know, there, there's a, a completely, a, a, a kind of a, a real change, not just in the underlying power dynamics, but in the attitude, in the way in which they approached it. And I felt like we weren't getting it. We weren't understanding that this was the, this was this broad change that was happening. And that when you thought about it in terms of the rise of China and India and Brazil, it was, we were entering a post-American world, not an anti-American world, not a world, you know, not a Chinese world, but a world in which America had lost that singular status that it had had. I'll give you one example of why it matters that we didn't understand this. People forget now, but the Iraq war might've gone very differently if it had gone according to the original plan. The original plan was to have a two-front invasion through uh, Kuwait in the south and through Turkey in the north. The United States, particularly the Defense Department, was so sure that the Turks would say yes, because, I mean, this is, you know, what the way they had always behaved. They, they almost didn't bother to ask them. And then at the last minute, they realized that Turkey was not on board with this. And Turkey was not on board. Because as everyone explained to Paul Wolfowitz, the Deputy Secretary of Defense, we are now a mature democracy, he said. We have to put this to a vote in parliament. I will support you, but it has to go to a vote in parliament. 
and it lost in the Turkish parliament by one vote. And so all of a sudden, at the last minute, after Bofuerts makes this insane speech, uh, a comment where he says, he, you know, he thought better of the Turks, the Turks and the Spaniards because he thought that they were believed in the culture of bullfighting and, and, and warriorship or something like that. Uh, the Americans have to come up with a new plan, which was essentially a one, you know, one front one. And at that point, Rumsfeld says, well, we're going to do it anyway. We're just going to do it with the forces we have. So, you know, if you think about the, the, the fundamental problem of order breaking down in, in Iraq once we go in, it might have been very different if we had not, if we had actually thought through the realities of this post-American world. You had written, you came up with the concept of illiberal democracy, the notion of some of these newly transitioning third wave democratic states, which would be democratic in procedure, but not liberal in, in attitude. Uh, but you had thought of that as a foreign problem, not a domestic problem. And although the rise of the rest and the post-American world was the feature of the book. It was not yet a sort of return to great power competition. Uh, in the teens, uh, populism surges at home and abroad. Uh, the rest suddenly get antsy and you end up getting a return to some kind of great power competition, not necessarily war, but uh, uh, dramatic tensions. Did you see the populism of the teen and and you know, did you see the populism of the teens coming and the lack of liberalization of China coming? And how did your views change as you went through the teens? It's all related in a sense because fundamentally, I think what happens is that this expansion of of global capitalism, of information technology, of American power, um, doesn't go completely seamlessly. To put it very simply, right? You have the global financial crisis, you have the Iraq war, um, and those two things more than anything else discredit American power. One discredits American military power, one discredits American economic power. Uh, and the economic power in some ways may have been even more fundamental because people really believed that the world was moving in a particular direction uh, economically and that the end point was going to be the United States of America economically. Everyone's economies needed to become as dynamic, as efficient, as open as, uh, as the United States. And nobody believed this more than the Chinese. The Chinese, when they would do a, you know, a reform of some kind or the other, the first question they'd always ask is, how do the Americans do it? What, 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 how does the American SEC structure? What, what, how, what, what does the Fed do? And then you have a financial crisis that almost brings the world economy down, largely emanating out of America, largely emanating out of the American private sector. And so it, it stuns everybody. Uh, there's this one, fascinating moment in Paul, uh, Hank Paulson's memoirs, the Secretary of Treasury, uh, where he goes to China, to Beijing, to see his old friend Wang Qishan, one of the kind of mandarins of China, vice premier in charge of the economy. And this guy, Wang Kishan, welcomes him and says, Hank, um, I have to ask you a question. You were our teachers. We always believed that, you know, we, we wanted to learn everything from you. And we look at all this and we realize our teachers have nothing to teach us. You know, this whole thing was a house of cards. That feeling, that, that sense of the American model no longer being the, the city on the hill was, I think, very, very powerful. And then underlying it was a third thing that was happening, which was the massively disruptive nature of the growth. We yeah. always think of growth as very good, right? Growth sounds like what could be again, what, what could be wrong with it? But what we forget about growth is it's highly disruptive by its nature, right? You're destroying old industries. You're destroying old communities. You're destroying... Uh, you know, all these, the, the churn that takes place, right? You may end up at a higher GDP point, but there's all these towns that got that got hollowed out in the middle and there's these new ones that rose, right? Um, but people don't move that fast. So you have large amounts of discontent and resentment that actually don't come from a situation where everything is just stable and continuing. It's the churn, it's the, it's the up and down that causes this enormous sense of, dislocation and anxiety and resentment. And I don't think we 
you know, and honestly, this is, I think, a, a kind of a, a, a problem of the top 10% of the country being so divorced from some of these realities that we always thought this is good. Hey, it means you've got fancier goods in the in, in the malls and, you know, nicer cars to drive and everyone's, you know, getting a bigger bonus. But the reality is you have this, this enormous discontent growing. Um, and I think that that translated into a very illiberal kind of populism. Um, it translated into a a sense of, you know, why is why is you know why is all this happening? It might, and, and it's always in times like that easy to blame. You know, you want to you want to find somebody to blame, and you either blame the people in power because there's some conspiracy that has denied you your rights, or you blame foreigners, outsiders, people who look different, who sound different, who worship different gods. And that's basically what happened. Uh, everywhere you look in the Western world, where you see this kind of right-wing cultural populism, you see immigration. There's no country which has had this these kind of immigration flows where you don't see it. Immigration is, in a sense, the visceral form of globalization. But you can't see and touch and feel the, the, the transport of goods and capitals and services. That's all happening in the kind of ether. What you can see is the Polish plumber who comes to, to, to London. What you can see is the Mexican who comes to, into, New, into New York. And fascinatingly, in all these places, the strongest opposition to, to immigration comes from places that have no immigrants. Right, it's like it's not New York where they worry about immigrants because they know they're just folk and they're actually not that different from you. Yeah, it's in Iowa and in Ohio and in Arizona and in Montana where they, you know, they believe that Sharia law is about to be imposed in New York City. Or you know, I mean, there are places in Florida that have that passed legislation to ensure that Sharia law is never passed in in Florida. Like, but, you know, and that. To somebody living with a lot of immigrants seems bizarre, right? But but that's that kind of illiberal populism, a popular, you know, populism that says, I don't care what the Bill of Rights says, I don't care what the that that's the the dynamic we're in right now. I, I, as you say, I wrote about this in the 90s, about because I'd go to places like like Turkey and the Philippines and Pakistan, and I'd see these people voting, but I'd notice. That once the majority party came in power, they would oppress the minorities. They would destroy the the judiciary. They would try, you know, try to obliterate rule of law. So you were getting a kind of what Tocqueville called the tyranny of the majority. I have to confess, I never thought it would quite happen in the Western world the way it did. And it was a one. It was a, a fascinating reminder of how fragile political institutions are. At the end of the day. You know, Emerson once said, institutions are, are just the lengthened shadows of men and, and women, he meant. But, but it really puts it right. Like when you think about, when you think about, you know, what stopped Trump from being able to, to nullify this election, uh, you know, we can talk all we want about checks and balances. It was that there were six or seven Republican officials in these various states, Brad Raffensperger and Georgia most, you know, prominently. Who said no? I will not sign a, a fake document claiming that these election results were wrong. If they had done the opposite, all those institutions, the checks and balances, the Constitution, all that would have been there. But you would have had a fraudulent election. You would have had a legitimate election overturned. So it's it's that fragile. It turns out, you know, and for whatever reason, in many of these countries, unfortunately, including India and Turkey and you don't have those six or seven people. Um, and you, you don't have them in the judiciary. You don't have them in the bureaucracy. And as a result, you are seeing a decaying of democracy in many of these places. COVID comes along. You actually had predicted that, but not expected it. In other words, you thought it was a possibility. You'd written about it. It was um, great for the back blurb of the book that I wrote after that, because I could say that I had predicted, which was totally legitimate. Um, the uh, thing about these things is people only remember the thing prediction you get right. You can you can make lots of wrong predictions. Nouriel Roubini, the great you know seer of the of the of the crash of 08, subsequently predicted like ten things that didn't happen. 
a crash in China, double dip in the United States, the collapse of the dollar, none of it happened. But the only thing people remember is that he, you know, so it's a very perverse incentive in our business to constantly make catastrophic predictions because when you get it right, people will remember and nobody remembers you wrong. I would argue that one of the things that distinguishes your commentary has been, however, the opposite of that, which is a sort of an honesty of what you've gotten right and what you've gotten wrong in an attempt to update you in a kind of Bayesian way, your, your framework. Uh, and you spent the pandemic or at least the early stages of the pandemic knocking out yet another bestseller, uh, 10 lessons for a post pandemic world, which basically took stock of a whole bunch of areas uh, from politics to economics to to everything else in the world, and in effect said, okay, we actually are at a completely new kind of place, and many of the understandings that we've had were wrong, and this is how things look now. In 2023, as you look at the world today, and we're brought finally up to state, not only what do you see the world like today, but how given that, as we've just talked about, every several years, stuff has come along that nobody predicted and that has changed how we think about things. Where do you get the confidence to continue to opine about the next kind of thing? And how do you, you know, is that how do you, well, basically, where, where do you see we us being now? And how does the shadow of the changes that have occurred in the past affect your views of how things might go forward from here? Well, it's a very good question because fundamentally, you know, you have to be humble about recognizing just how, uh, you know, part of it is just how complex the world is. You know, the, the degree to which something unexpected in one place can have a knock-on effect and change the way you think about the whole world is just part of this incredibly, I mean, if you think about the, the predicting in a, in a in a world with a thousand or 10,000 or 100,000 variables, that's the complexity of, of the world we live in. The, the, the big trend I think I see is the end of that era that I described of American hegemony, the end of a kind of holiday from history. If you think of the, you know, the era that I was describing as something of a, of a kind of strange uh, interregnum, uh, and the return of great power politics. That is the fundamental dynamic we are in now, right? It is the return of um, the normal, what was have been a normal feature of international life for most of history, which is countries asserting themselves uh, on the basis of their national power, their national preferences. And so you're seeing it in the rise of China, you're seeing it in the return of Russia. So these are the two great powers in a sense challenging American hegemony, but you're seeing it in a variety of other uh, medium powers, Iran, but not just, you know, we think of it in those kind of hostile terms, but think about Turkey, as I said, playing its own role, a kind of freelancing role where it just wants to its own, all it can, everything Turkey does now is really just about what's in it for me. So you want to expand NATO and they're like, great, what's in it for me? Uh, I want the Swedes to change their laws on terrorism and put all these Kurds in, in prison. And if you don't do that, we won't let Sweden into NATO. Uh, you know, it's 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 become much more transactional, much more freelancing. But think about Saudi Arabia, a country that exists under the protection of the United States and is now busy trying to make a deal with China because it realizes that at the end of the day, China is buying much more oil from them than we are. And so they're trying to establish a new relationship with them. They, you know. Most countries in Latin America now have China as their largest trading partner, not the United States. And that changes the dynamic. So that reality of a world of a new world of great power politics is, I think, probably the fundamental um, thing going on. And the second is the, 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 the dominance of politics over economics. For 30 years, economics trumped politics. You know, at the end of the day, uh, uh, Tom Friedman had a very nice uh, uh, metaphor for it. He's, he called it the golden straight jacket. What he said meant was that countries would agree to not act in ways that they politically wanted to because they wanted growth. And so they would all follow along this neoliberal reformist path uh, because they all knew that there was an enormous upside to it. So, so the, the way I think he puts it is you put on a golden straitjacket so that your politics shrank, but your, your economy grew. Uh, and that dynamic, that bargain was accepted 
I remember an Indian prime minister telling me once when I asked him, you know, your reforms are great and they're going to help the Indian economy. What happens if you lose the next election? And he said to me, you know, the truth is, Fareed, the next government will have to do roughly what I'm doing. Because at the end of the day, we want growth. They're going to want to raise incomes. They're going to want to get, you know, get reelected. This is the only path forward. That sense, that dynamic has gone. If you want to think about Brexit as the most important marker of that, you know, here you have one of the world's most sophisticated countries, one of the world's largest economies, deliberately and consciously decide that they would like to have worse economic relations with their largest trading partner. Right? 50, 45% of British exports go to the European Union. And their, and their decision was, we would like to have more tariffs, barriers, obstacles to that, that trade. And the result we can see, it's happening. And Britain is going to have a worse economic performance this year than Russia. Right? That tells you something. And it's all a consequence of Brexit because you've taken your biggest market and you've created all these obstacles at every level. You know, the Eurostar, just as one kind of relatable metaphor, is running at 60% capacity because they can't process the passports and because you didn't have to do any of that before. And now it's in, you know, there's no longer borderless travel. So think about that with every good, every service, every, you know, everything has now had friction thrown into it. And that is a conscious decision to say, I want to privilege politics over economics, national pride, political sovereignty, call it what you will. But we're all doing it in some way, right? I mean, the Chinese say we want a made in China program, which means everything has to be made in China. It doesn't, you know, not looking for the most efficient system. We're not, but by the way, we have a made in America system. Biden's Buy in America program is very similar in many ways. It is an effort to say, we're going to build all this stuff, but it has to be made in America. And the Europeans are coming up with their version of that. And the Indians already have a Made in India plan, which was a copy of the Made in China plan. So everyone is now privileging politics over economics, right? And the third trend, if I would have, there were three shining stars here, which was American power, you know, uh, open economics uh, and open technology. The third is we're all becoming much more suspicious of technology. Right? There was a sense in which technology was just going to be incredibly liberating and going to provide, uh, you know, democratize the world and open up information and give the small guy in, in, in enormous advantages. I think what we've all seen is that it has actually created a world of extraordinary monopolies and oligopolies, like, like nothing you've ever seen before. I mean, I'm, you, you know, you'd be hard best to even describe what the second best, you know, that it, it, there is, there is no, no Avis to the hurts of a Google or an Amazon, right? It's, it, it's, it turns out the digital economy works best when you have this massive winner-take-all system where the, the, the company that gets their first and best just dominates the entire world and the entire world economy and creates these extraordinary fortunes. And I don't think anyone quite predicted that. And, and, and you know, even regulation is struggling to figure out what do you do about it. But those those are the three things I think that have changed fundamentally. I'm going to turn this over, bring our audience in to ask their questions. But I'm going to take one last one, which is, and and yet, and yet, the story you just told is being told or has been told by a bunch of people as a kind of cyclical story. We're back to a world of great power competition. We're back to a world of protectionism. There's nothing new under the sun, the eternal return, the illusions of a liberal international order, the illusions of an American era century and all that. That was just an epiphenomenon, temporary epiphenomenon of American power. And we're now back to the same old story. At the same time, the trends you're talking about have materialized, though. There have been other sectors in which there's been much more secular progress. Your father went to England uh, as a student, and now an Indian immigrant is the prime minister, uh, the child of Indian, you know, the offspring of Indian immigrants is the prime minister of, of Great Britain. The uh, uh, Obama was president in a way that you could not have imagined having been there. The uh, 
the Me Too movement, Black Lives Matter, gay marriage, and the, a general loosening of, of uh, norms in, in personal sphere, all these represent, I would argue, what our old professor Sam Huntington talked about as the sort of cyclical time of America confronting its ideals and really realizing it wasn't living up to them and going through convulsion, which produces a society that's more liberal, more tolerant, more diverse. So how do you square the notion of a world going back to the past in its own conflictual, multicultural way with the reality of a world that is still globalized, is still moving forward through connection, and that is ever more liberal and tolerant, even though we're less tolerant of the slowness with which that occurs. Yeah, it actually, this is the, I'm, the, I'm, the, the book I'm writing now, I'm trying to grapple with exactly this problem. And I think the best way to describe it is when you have massive disruption that is caused by economic and technological change, you almost always spawn, uh, uh, create a kind of identity revolution. And that identity revolution almost always uh, has the characteristic of being reactionary. You know, take me back to something, take me back to the before the world started changing. The most important word in Trump's uh, cap is again, make America great again. Because he's promising something vague to everybody, right? And it means a different thing to every person. It means, you know, to some people, it means to a, a, a world back before women were uppity, a world back before, you know, when blacks knew their place, a world when you didn't have so much immigration, a world when manufacturing was still the mainstay of the American economy. But, you know, but it's a kind of imagined past. Uh, you know, I, 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 nobody, anybody who actually accurately knows what was going on then would know that these were not the great halcyon days. But it's a very powerful. It's a very powerful force that 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 shape has shaped society throughout. But as you say, these broad structural changes that caused all the disruption, they are continuing to move. You know, they are continuing to move. And so, I think sometimes what happens is we mistake the undertow for a wave. In other words, the wave is moving forward, and it is moving us. But there is an undertow, and there is a backlash, and there are there are, and sometimes the backlash has real. You know, you have to worry about things that that are happening. Uh, this problem, as I was saying about the 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 uh, the nature of growth being so unequal. Fundamentally, capitalist growth is always uh, by nature unequal because it's completely unplanned, spontaneous. You know, and it happens in a kind of serendipitous way. But that does create this reality. That people feel completely left behind, ignored. There's there's a wonderful piece, a uh, letter somebody sent me, an email after Trump was elected, knowing that I, I, I was horrified by that that prospect. And he and he said he, he said he said to me, I am a non college educated man who lives in a small town in the south, um, and I am a God fearing Christian. And when I look at the world, I feel, when I look at America today, I feel as though I don't exist. When I watch a movie, it's always set in New York or San Francisco. When I watch a TV show, it's set in some cool loft in, you know, in Soho or maybe Chicago if you get lucky. Um, when you listen to the music, it's all coming out of New York. It's the rap out of New York. It's a, when you when you when you uh, look at the you know the the, the things we're, we're we're supposed to consume, they're all emanating the music. You know, and he was and he was saying it wasn't always like that. I grew up in a world in which you know Bonanza was on the on the air and Gunsmoke and the Beverly Hillbillies, and and it's true that there has been this weird. Um, this this creation of of two Americas, one of which is urban, one you know more educated, less religious, richer, and this other rural America that we know very little about and that does not feature. You know, and what he was sort of trying to say is it's not just about money; it's about recognition, it's about a sense of dignity, about a sense of being of belonging. And I think you know sometimes that that backlash is real and has to be addressed. But that backlash can't shape the future. Uh, ultimately, there is no answer there to the problems of the, of the present. And so you move on. And you move on, as you say, three steps forward, one step back, two steps back. You can, you can decide how it, what it looks like. 
Um, and and I, I believe that about a lot of what we're doing now, a lot of this privileging of politics over economics, a lot of it, you know, it's going to have lots of problems. The idea that, you know, the American government knows how best to spend, you know, money building uh, computer chip factories is a very suspect feeling. I mean, to my mind, you know, I mean, look at what they just did with this CHIPS Act. The first big grant went to Intel, okay? Intel, uh, as a company, once great, for the last 20 years, was unable to compete against TSMC, the great Taiwanese chip manufacturer, completely unable, tried very hard. It's not like Intel didn't have access to money. Intel is not capital starved as a company. It's one of the great technology companies of California, right? So what does the federal government do to, as a reward for this failure? It gives it $4 billion. Um, what is it, 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 the next grant went to General Motors, which was given $2 billion as a reward for having failed to compete against Tesla in, in making electric vehicles. And so that's how it goes. Like, you know, the, the, the really the grants should be given to the new startups that are going to come up with fascinating new ways to make computer chips or EVs. But they don't have lobbyists in Washington. They can't promise massive employment, you know, Im immediately in states and therefore get governors lined up. So the, so the whole thing, I think, is going to have problems. Um, but, you know, so I'm at one level trying to characterize the world as I see it moving. But look, I mean, I'm a classical liberal. I would much prefer a world, as I said, I'm an un unrepentant neoliberal. I think that at the end of the day, openness, uh, both politically, economically, and, and of course, culturally, I mean, this is what allows human beings to flourish. I, I grew up in a, you know, in a country uh, that was much more conservative, much more socially conservative. And so whenever people talk about the loss of community and talk about, oh, you know, wonderful small communities, I want to grasp for an oxygen mask. I mean, these are the most stifling, oppressive places that if you are in any way unusual, you will push down, you were repressed, you, you know, I mean, uh, so at the end of the day, uh, you know, maybe that's why I, I live in New York. I could go on forever with this, but we want to bring you guys in. So let's turn now. Let's bring the lights up. We have people here. Please raise your hands. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yes, over here. Two questions. Uh, one a big announcement today in the Philippines by the Secretary of Defense said it's a big deal. Like your comment on that. And the second one is just listening to everything you've said tonight. And we're losing the second world war generation. And I don't think people really understand what a third world war could look like. And it's kind of disturbing. And it feels like we're in Teutonic shifts that are going on. Are we in the late thirties again, or is it something different? Um, Oh boy, that's a that's a that's a, uh, a a loaded question. So let me answer the first. I mean, in a way, the two combine. But what's happening in the Philippines is the U.S. and, and the Philippines are doing more military, significantly more in terms of military cooperation. The reason this is significant um, is this is actually something that is a very powerful force multiplier for the United States, which is. We grew to great powerdom, a superpowerdom, in a very unusual situation that has almost never happened in human history before. We, the United States, is guarded by two vast oceans and two weak neighbors. Sorry, any Canadians or Mexicans who are in the right. So you have a kind of unique situation where you can grow enormously rich, enormously powerful without threatening the very existence of a lot of other countries around you. China is growing rich and powerful in a completely different geopolitical atmosphere. It is growing rich and powerful in the middle of Asia. And as it rises, as it grows, it scares the bejesus out of lots of countries around it. India, Japan, South Korea. The reason the Philippines is so interesting is the, the Philippines government, has actually wanted to make nice with the Chinese because the Chinese bribed them both as a, as a government, but even personally. I, I think that one of the mechanisms of Chinese influence is you, you, you do well to look at the Swiss bank accounts of the leaders of Cambodia and Laos and the Philippines and you know all these places. 
But even that was not enough because the, you know, the, the truth is that these all these Chinese uh, naval maneuvers are scaring the Philippines, making them worry about their actual national security. And so they realize that they need an alliance with the United States. So they're kind of reviving this old uh, uh, alliance. Almost, it's funny, it's the Marcos era alliance being revived by the son of Marcos. Um, and that reality, I think, helps the United States enormously. Uh, I think it fundamentally means in some ways it's very different from uh, from the 30s because the United States, unlike in the 30s, is present, is armed, is engaged, is aligned with all these countries around the world. What makes it much more hair-raising, of course, is you're talking about a much more complicated geopolitical dynamic with Russia, with China, and with a lot of nuclear weapons. Um, and that's the part that I think becomes very, very complex. So look at what's going on in North Korea right now. The North Koreans have conducted 90 missile tests this year. Um, South Korea, and this is the thing that caught my attention. So for those of you who watch the program, you'll see I, I do something about it this, this Sunday. The poll taken three days ago asked South Koreans, do you want a nuclear weapon? To give you context, if you had asked that question 10 years ago, I think the number would have been like 20 or 30%. The number was 77% of South Koreans now believe they need a nuclear weapon to deter against North Korea's nuclear weapon. That's a very dangerous scenario because if, if they were, I mean, South Korea is an advanced industrial power. They could go nuclear in three months if they wanted to. They have all the technology. If they did something like that, what would Japan do? Right? It's that kind of dynamic, and that's what I mean by the post-American nature of it. It's not just about a Chinese state. It's, it's about so many moving parts, and the United States trying to manage and balance these at a time when the American people are not that interested in, in international affairs. That's the challenge. So you see, at a two finger on that, you see nuclear weapons more destabilizing than stabilizing. They're more complicating. Look, there is a there's an argument people make that nuclear weapons fundamentally stabilize, and there's something to, to be said for that, which is they raise the stakes. Everyone gets serious. You know, the Indians and the Pakistanis fought three wars until they both got nuclear weapons, and now there's mu you know much less of that. Now, on the other hand, as a result, there has been 30 years of incessant terrorism across the borders making a kind of, you know, that the area around Kashmir a kind of hell uh, for anyone involved. So there are costs that come with it. But, but you know, I'm not one of these people who sees China has about 300 nuclear weapons right now. We have about three or 4,000. They're going to go to about 1,500. They, they, you know, that's already, it's pretty clear if you look at their nuclear planning. I, do I look at that and say, oh, yay, the Chinese are going to have more nuclear? No. I, you know, it worries me because it does add complexity to the to the to the problem. Uh, if you get to a stable balance of power where both sides know each other and there are arms control mechanisms in place and communication mechanisms and hotlines where each is talking to the other, as we had with the Soviet Union and as we still sort of have with Russia, yeah, I'm okay with that. But so, in other words. I, I'm I'm okay with where we ended up with the Soviet Union in the 60s and 70s after arms control and confidence building measures and communication. Where we were in the 50s, where we almost went to war with them three times over Taiwan, actually, uh, in, in two cases, that seems a little hair-raising to me. I'm more optimistic. Yes, let's go back right here in the back. Here. Oh, you're here. Uh, thank you for coming. That was an interesting presentation. Gideon did a very nice job of... Uh, exhibiting your insights at turns. And so I'd like to return to the uh, question of great power uh, conflict and specifically, who do you see on the other side between China and Russia and India? I mean, you see now the Chinese-Russian relationship during this war. You see India is still buying a lot of oil from Russia. You mentioned the relationship between the Saudis and the Chinese is developing. So how will the other side form itself? Yeah, it's a very good question. I, I think fundamentally, Russia is now the greatest rogue regime, the rogue state uh, in the international system, because it fundamentally wants to tear down the international order as it exists. The Russians have, have always had something of a spoiler state uh, uh, attitude towards it. Partly it's because Russia is fundamentally a, a, an oil a resource country. It, had, it produces nothing. 
It, it is entirely extractive, which means that in a weird way, geopolitical tension and conflict help it. Because what happens in periods of geopolitical conflict? Oil prices go up, right? Energy prices go up. China is very different. China is fundamentally a country that has benefited from peace and stability and the status quo. So while they both pose a challenge to American hegemony, because they both don't like the idea of living under a world entirely constructed by the United States, the Russians are a little bit, you know, Samson, bring the, bring, bring the temple down. Uh, whereas the Chinese, I think, have a much more complicated attitude towards it. They would like to be able to exist in this world, thrive in this world, take advantage of many of the aspects of this world, like the open market and the open trading system, uh, where they themselves remain somewhat closed, but they can in a predatory fashion access it. And the great challenge, I think, for American diplomacy is going to be, with, the, with Russia at this point, there is nothing other than, you know, I, I think you have to defeat it. You have to defeat this I don't mean Russia as a, as a country, but you have to defeat this challenge uh, and this particularly the aggression in, in Ukraine. But with China, it's a much more complicated question. Can you find a way to coexist with a country that in many ways has integrationist elements to it, that wants to, as I say, well, likes stability, likes peace, prosperity, international trade, but deter the you know certain elements of it? So can you play this? Can you can you play this kind of mixed role uh, with China? That's the th that would be the by far the preferred outcome, because a world in which you enter into a cold war with China is going to look completely different than we can imagine. Remember, Russia was nothing. Uh, the Soviet Union was nothing on the world economy. China is the second largest economy in the world. China is. By the largest trading state, uh, nation in the world, the largest manufacturing nation in the world. As I said, most countries in Latin America, their largest trade is with China. Most countries in Asia, their largest trade is with, is with China. So you would be undertaking a complete wrenching disintegration of the world economy. Uh, you would be raising tensions sky high. You would be in a situation where it's not clear that you can just outspend the Chinese. Remember, the Chinese don't have to get as rich as America per capita uh, because they're four times bigger. And so, you know, they, they have, there's a lot of staying power there. And, and it seems unnecessary because the Chinese do not seem as determined to tear down the world order as the Russians do. So that feels to me the place where American foreign policy should be trying to go. I, I think the danger is there is a bit, there is a grown a kind of bipartisan consensus that it's great fun to bash China, that it's great, you know, that it's, that it's, and it, it you know, there are legitimate issues, but we're losing sight of the stakes, I think. Can we make sure we ask some, uh, a, a, a woman, a lady, I think there's somebody at the back there. Yeah. I feel like there's so many of you putting your hands up and I Especially noticed this distressing tendency for the, 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 the mic to always go. When I was teaching, I'll tell you a quick story. When I was teaching at Harvard, um, when, when Gideon and I both went to Yale and to grad school at Harvard together, and I had a seminar, and I got the first papers in, and I got them from these two women who never said a word in class. And so I called them into office hours, and I said, why don't you guys, you know, say something? And one of them said, and these are two such guys, stayed with me for my whole life. One of them said, you know, I feel as though if somebody makes the point I was going to make, I don't need to make it anymore. And I thought to myself, no man has ever thought like that. Right. The, 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 govern, the, governing, the, governing principle of, the governing principle of the Harvard faculty lounge used to be everything has been said, but not everybody has said it. Um, and the second woman said to me, you know, I do put my hand up. You just don't notice. Um, and, I re and I realized she was right. Anyway, sorry. Um, yes. OK, I have a question that um, I'd, I'd really like you to respond to when you're talking about, um, you know, like UK um, um, prioritizing politics over um, the economics and kind of like looking at it in that binary way. What about adding climate change to the um, discussion? Because I think that's like the elephant in the room. Yeah, that's look. That's a great. That's a great point. Um, 
the way I would I would describe the way at least I think about climate is the reason we have to care about the climate is because ultimately it is fundamentally about economics. If we don't have a planet, we won't have an economy, right? So it's actually in our enlightened self-interest to be figuring out how to transition uh, to a to a system that allows us to survive, thrive, grow. And that's one of the reasons I've always felt, the you know, we, what we really need to do, my simple solution is we need to have a carbon tax because the simplest thing in the world that economists will tell you is the thing you want less of, tax. The thing you want more of, subsidize. The government is very bad at picking winners or two losers, but if you just, if you believe all this carbon being emitted into the atmosphere is bad, put a tax on it. And then guess what? Through the magic of the of capitalism, people will produce less of the thing that is expensive, right? So if we do that and then take the the, the revenues from it and massively invest in new green technologies, because we don't have the, you know, for what everything that people like Bill McKibben say, we don't have the technologies. Now we are not at the point where we are able to scale. Uh, you know, we don't have, you can't store solar and wind. We don't have battery power that can do it. So we need massive investment, massive innovation. To just give you a simple example of this. In 1978, the amount of coal that we burned uh, you know, fossil, uh, as part of the total world energy mix uh, was um, 38%. Do you know what it is now after all this? 37%. Fossil fuels, you, you know, 80% of the mix in 1980, they're now 79% of the mix. So, you know, the truth is we, are, we still don't have what we need. We, what we need is something that really massively allows us to use lots of energy that is cheap, and that does not emit. Uh, that's where Bill Gates was once asked, what's your, you know, if you had one wish in the world to make, what would it be? He said, for an energy source that is cheaper than coal and as clean as nuclear. In other words, zero emissions cheaper than coal. Because that's where we need to go. Because because if we don't go, if we don't get that, forget about us, the Chinese, the Indians, you know, the Africans, they're, they're all going to be burning coal-fired power plants. And so that's where we need to go. Um, but you're absolutely right to remind us that, you know, there is this much larger issue. It's, it always feels like it's sort of above my pay grade because I feel like, you know, if this is going to happen, we're all going to die. So I don't, I, 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 I don't know what the, what the answer is. It, it leaves you in a very pessimistic place. I have time for one more question today. Hi. Um, so like in regards to your anecdote earlier regarding um, the dichotomy of the two, like Americas and their you know, dichotomous cultures, um, how do you see this um, tension changing in the future, especially in regards to like the tensions in the Republican Party recently, uh, congressionally, and as well as the January 6th insurrection? Um, yeah, it's a great question. Look, the, 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 the kind of illiberal populism that I was talking about took its most dramatic form in, on January 6th. You actually had armed militias uh, go into, into the Capitol and try to overturn an election. And then you had Republican congressmen inside the hall after that voting to overturn the election, right? I mean, the only reason the election didn't get overturned was because you didn't have a Republican majority. Otherwise, they would have, they would have overturned that, that, that election. So it's very worrying. Um, and what, what, what worries me uh, about it is structurally the trends that have produced these two Americas are still in place. In other words, you are still in a world in which the gains for an education are much, much greater than for not. The job prospects for people who are uh, skilled are much, much greater. And that people who want those kind of jobs tend to go to cities. Uh, and they tend to go to church less, you know, so that that divide culturally between the two worlds is only growing. Um, the, the, there was a, a wonderful study done about, wonderful, a fascinating study done about these, these uh, towns and small towns in places like Pennsylvania and Ohio. And you ask, who are the employers there? And it turns out there are basically two employers, the federal, the government and hospitals. That's it. Because even in those towns, all the young, bright people, you know, they, they may not come to New York, but they went to Cleveland or they went to Cincinnati or they, you know. And so you you have this 
hollowing out that's taking place. Uh, Boris Johnson appointed a minister of leveling up. And this is a British term, right? And so they put all these programs in place. Guess what happened? The urban centers in Britain did, 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 got a larger share of the leveling up money than the others, because guess what? Even any, any incentive structure you create, the bright, enterprising, hardworking hustlers are going to get that somehow. And the people who are not are not, right? And so it's, it's not clear what you do about it. I, I, at some level, I feel as though we are, you know, the part of me that is optimistic about this is that fundamentally, this is part of a larger uh, kind of transformation of America that is taking place. Most of it is actually not around economics. It's around race, culture, religion, because that's what hits people. You know, that's what gets them in their gut. And we're trying to do something very different and difficult in this country, which is create genuinely like the first universal nation, you know, where people of every kind, from every part of the world, from all backgrounds, all races, all religions, all sexual orientations are honored and respected and included and don't have to hide what they are and don't have to pretend that they're something else. Like that's very hard because, it, you know, you're, you're, everyone is revealing their, their, their oddities, their weirdness, their differences, right? We used to be about, if you think about 1950s America, we used to be about everybody trying to conform to a certain kind of wasp male model. And we all, and everybody wanted, you know, was to, would do that. And, you know, Jews who were growing up in that period would name their kids, you know, Milton and Irving and, 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 you know, and, and now it's exactly the opposite. Like everyone wants to affirm their difference. And I think it's, you know, it's tough. It's, it causes friction, but at some level, it's a wonderful experiment. And it's a very American experiment that we're trying to really let everyone be who they want to be and flourish. And I, you know, I'm an optimist and I have a genuine, a generally benign view of human nature. I think people will, will get it. And the best place you can see this is young people. They get it. They don't care. They're completely open. They're, they're much more tolerant. And if you, if you adopt that attitude, it becomes much easier to solve some of these other economic problems. I mean, after all, that's just money. You can, you know, you can split the difference. You can, you can divide it up in different ways. What's hard to do is to accept somebody who looks different, who sounds different, to, to really embrace that and to say, you know, we can all be part of one community. I, you know, like I said, look, I think at the end of the day, this is still the most amazing country in the world because it tries to do things like this. And I, I'm going to bet that at the end of the day, we'll succeed with a little bit of drama and a little bit of, uh, of, of, of tension, but we will succeed. Ladies and gentlemen, Farid Zafari. Thank you. Thank you.